if everybody's ready, we could <clears throat> start with the first item on our agenda. And there's no, um, no legal notice to read <clears throat> because this is uh, Todd Slaw of Sovereign Builders' request to um, meet with the board. And I understand what Todd's concern is because he and I had a conversation in, in a couple of email exchanges. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll say what I think the issue is and then Todd can jump in. <clears throat> um, we voted and I drew up the decision that um, followed our site view yeah. and we approved the uh, storage facility that Todd uh, is hoping to build. And the, the problem with the decision, if one reads it is, you can't tell how large of a um, building or, or series of buildings we approved. And <clears throat> the, the intent as I understood it was to approve the uh, building as shown on the plans prepared by his um, uh, planning company, uh, Levesque and Associates. <clears throat> And I started the decision the way I normally do, which was <clears throat> really just repeating what was on the application. And on the application, the part that we are familiar with as the ZBA, the, the single page request, there was a figure of 28,600 square feet. So I began the discussion by re repeating what was on that page. Now that, that's in itself a problem because that page was actually part of a larger application that Levesque had prepared. And I do recall when we read the legal notice, which reported that same number of 28,600 square feet, Todd appropriately, when Mary asked if there were any objections or I asked if there were any objections, said he did object to that number because if you read the larger plan, the square footage was about three times as large. <clears throat> so, the decision doesn't tie the board to that 28,600 square feet. In fact, it says we looked at the uh, plan prepared by Christopher Carney of Levesque and Associates dated April 29, 2021. And so it seems clear to me that that's the plan that we approved. And correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, that shows the square footage that you wanted on it. Am I right? Yes, Todd Solera from Sovereign Builders. It, it it does that. It's and page nine of the of the submittal, the special permit application. The narrative is very clear on on, and re, that narrative relates to the buildings that are in Levesque's plan. So I think the intent all along uh, was <clears throat> to approve that um, plan. Now, in rereading the minutes, I don't see that that plan was ever actually accepted into the, our record. It, it, it says that um, Chris shared the screen and showed that plan. But when I see what Mary had as receipts of documents for that hearing, it doesn't show that that plan was actually received. So one way out of this dilemma I was thinking was because I'm trying to save you, Todd, from reapplying and going through this whole thing again. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. The thing is, I'd like to, my proposal would be, <clears throat> have you send that to Mary? Well, you may have already done it during the week. I think you did. Actually, it was, it was done at the very beginning. And that's, I did, and I can forward again to you the email. It was done from, from Jessica at Rob Levesque's office to Mary McCarthy. I this, believe this is, I have it. You have um, it? Yes, uh, if I, it's been a kind of a different thing with, uh, are you saying maybe it wasn't in the documents listed at the end? That might have been an oversight on my part, but I do remember we had the plans. Right. So, yeah, I think, you know, with the Zoom, everything's different than it was. So it may just be, and you tell me, so I thought if you're going to be satisfied, if we have these minutes right here now reflect and we'll have to have the other voting members, which is Deborah and Kristen, agree <clears throat> that 
these plans that we'll enter into the record are the plans and show the square footage that you want. Um, and that was our intent all along. Um, and we <clears throat> acknowledge it in this meeting. If that would satisfy you, we'll, we could just take a roll call right now and make sure that's the case. That would satisfy me. And I, I wonder if we should also, I mean, I, I know that the, the special permit application, page nine, is part of this submission. Uh, is that in, in as part of the record? Because, you know, the third, third paragraph just describes really clearly the square footage. And I, I think I that's, I feel like, yeah, that's got to be in the record, right, Mary? Yep. It, it, okay, then. Well, it was, it was part of the whole narrative, and I know we have that. Yeah. yeah. So that part I'm of the I'm going to look it up right now and <laughs> just see what I can. I'll see what I have on this. Take me a minute here. Just another few seconds. I've got it up. I'm going for page nine. It says narrative addendum to application for a special permit which on my screen is page nine. Right, I know, I'm, I'm just <laughs> it's squirreling around on me here. Okay, I've got page nine here. What number is it? do you have? Fourth paragraph down, it says the main building is a 62,400 square foot three-story building with each floor 20,800 square feet that includes 600 square feet of office space. Uh, I'm just looking for that paragraph. Just above stormwater, where it says stormwater, just above that. You have a, is a paragraph that's numbered. Is it number four? No, it's not numbered. It's just, oh. yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I'm looking at what says page nine. 10 here what's the what's the title title to oh um well i'm sorry at the top of the page it's so i'm just i'm my computer screen says it's page nine it's um okay so it's the narrative addendum to applications yeah, yeah, so, i'm in the narrative okay so fourth uh, paragraph down let me go back to the beginning of the narrative <laughs> I wish I could share my screen. I could maybe. I do can. That. I would you like to share your screen? Um, I, I'll, I'll get it. it <laughs> then, if, if if my screen gets taken up by a shared screen, I don't know what I'll be doing. Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I can make either one of you a co-host and share a screen, but it might be easier not to do that. Sure. Yeah, because I haven't found what I'm looking to okay. share yet. <laughs> At the top of the page, it's the beginning of narrative addendum and it's introduction and property description. Yes, that's the page. So if you go to the fourth paragraph down. Oh, I see it. The main building is a 62,400 square foot. It says the main building is a 62,400 square foot three story building with each floor 20,800 square feet that includes 600 square feet of office space. The main building would comprise of various sized climate controlled self storage units, two single storage story, two single story storage buildings are also proposed 
at 4,600 square feet and 5,400 square feet, respectively. These buildings will not be climate controlled and will have ground floor access only. That's it. And we've, yes, we've, we've pretty much had that all along from quite early on. <clears throat> and then the plan, you have the plan? Uh, Part of the record. Hold on. There's site plans. I have site plans dated February 3rd. If anybody wants to uh, share this screen and take a look at what we've got, I'm, I'm okay with that now. Oh, okay, Mary, let me just do that. Um, you're a co-host. And at this point, you can share your screen. And what do I do to do that? Um, go to the bottom and yeah. you'll see an icon that says share screen. Green. Yep, it's green. And you can hit that button and you will uh, a window will open for you with whatever you want. Sorry, but I, don't, I don't see that. Go all the way down. It may be hidden, but the moment you put your cursor down there at the very bottom, it should come up. Hmm. See, this is. <laughs> that's okay. You know, that's okay. I if if it's I'm not coming minute. up. Okay, now I've got it. I have. I've got. Okay. I've got. I've got the 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 video back up, and here's share screen. Okay, so if you hit. So I hit the little arrow there, and hit the green the that green button, and it should bring up something that will have what you want to share, and you can we'll hit click the, on that. Yeah. Do you see a site plan? Yes, we do. <laughs> and you can make it a little larger by going up to the top where it says 22.8%. You can yep. make that. I might be able to do it, Mary, for you. Yes. Oh, she can do it. Yep. Okay. Let me just get. Thank you. Now I've got a thing blocking me from. <laughs> I know probably our images. I've got I've got people's names and everything on top of the thing, so it's kind of hard to. Uh, I was just going to go to where the ID for the plan was, so you could see whatever it was that. But that's exactly where. <laughs> that's exactly where the stuff is. <sighs> well, we can make it easy. Okay. <clears throat> so what know, other than date or any of that, but. I don't know what you want to look at. <laughs> Maybe you can see the whole thing. Can you see the whole thing? Can you see what's on the uh, right-hand edge as you're looking at it? I can, yeah. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm probably the only one who can't. Can, do you think you can move it around, Deborah? Um, well, let's hold off on this part because I don't think we need to see it. What I want to say is this. Are the other two voting members, Deborah and Kristen, in agreement that the project that we approved for Sovereign Builders is the same project as shown on the plans submitted with the initial application. Yes. Yes. Agreement. Right. Yes. Because that is what we actually showed in the meeting. And that is what we thought was attached to the, the what we voted on, because that's what we had. The, I guess the only place it was, um, wrong was somewhere on the application page for the zba application right right the, the right. But so having, having that thought and having both of you said yes and i'll ask mary to reflect that in the minutes Todd, are you satisfied i am thank you yes so then mary even before you complete the whole minutes for this meeting and we've got three other hearings lined up if it's possible for you to just get out a subsection of the of, of the minutes that the other right. members can approve, and then we'll get it over to Todd, and he could well, whatever he needs. Hold on, for. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> not not at this minute. But, well, not this minute. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so not not this minute, but subsequent to when we're done tonight. After the meeting. Okay. After the, yes, but but without right. having, without having to draft up all the other ones. Right. Okay. All right. I think we're good, Todd. Sounds great. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time tonight. Good seeing you. Bye-bye. Right.
All right. Hey, Fred, how you doing? He's muted. Doing good. Thanks, Roger. Doing good. Okay, good. All right. Well, we're, we're keeping to our schedule anyway. We are. <laughs> and everybody's in who has come. And let me just, re and everybody appears to have their name up, which is good. Okay. We have a guest. Let me send that message again. We do have Dave's phone. I don't know who Dave is. <laughs> One more time, somebody's new. Who was the guest, Deborah? I do not know. I have sent a message asking okay. Okay. guest if you would like to change your screen name so we can record it accurately. I put it into the chat, but now I'm putting it in verbally. <laughs> If the, if the guest should speak, the guest will need to identify themselves. All right, well, it's seven o'clock. Chris, are you uh, there? I am. Welcome back. Good to be here. Um, so uh, this is a continuation for proposed uh, cannabis manufacturing at Three River Road um, or the current uh, CNA repair shop. Uh, last time we were here, uh, there were a number of questions and requests for additional information, um, and we uh, submitted uh, a couple of documents as well as some revised plans to the board, um, and I'd like to just uh, briefly go over some of that additional information that's been provided, um, and I guess I'll start with the site plan, um, and if I could be made co-host, I can bring that up. Um, yes, I'm doing that more. right now. Great. Hey, Chris, while that's going on. Can you tell us what is the status of your application with the planning board? Yes, they approved us uh, site plan review um, last week on Tuesday. So you're done with them? Correct. And so the plan that you're about to show us is the one that was approved by them? Yes, it is. 
And we're also through the Hatfield uh, Planning Board as well. Yeah, I was going to touch on that just in a minute, just because that's sure. a little more complicated. But um, so to zoom in here. Excuse me, Chris, but could you please give me the date on these plans before I forget to ask? Sure. I'm going to have to look at it myself because I don't remember. This was a revision as of July 27th. Thank you. Um, and so um, the major changes to the site plan as compared to what we presented last time, um, two portions of the existing building are now proposed to be demolished, um, including the portion, oops, sorry, what was that? Okay, um, including the portion that extended into the front yard um, of the property uh, and over the 50 foot setback line that we had talked about last time. Um, it turns out that it's, uh, this isn't a terribly valuable piece of building, which, which was something we suspected after exploring it a little bit more. Um, and so um, that's being demolished. We have reoriented the site so that the main driveway entrance, um, as was suggested, I think here, um, but possibly at planning board the first time we were there, um, so that now the main parking lot, which remains on the south side of the building, has a straight in and out on the river road, which allows traffic to be more well oriented and improves the sight lines in both directions. Um, I will note that that driveway is actually in Hatfield. Um, again, the, the town line is right here, um, but I do think it's relevant to, to highlight these things overall as far as the site. And we believe, uh, actually appreciate those comments from last time because I think overall, I'm much happier with this um, site plan and I think it's gonna operate more safely than what we had before. We are proposing to retain um, a driveway at the existing um, location, but to be visually diminished and only used occasionally for truck access to the north side of the building. This would be done by having a narrower driveway, only 15 feet versus the 24 for the main driveway. By using that porous aggregate surface that we're including in the parking lot over here in order to diminish it uh, as, as a desirable place to enter the site. And then it would also be uh, chained off uh, with some large planters there, um, again, to, to just visually read as not a site entrance. Um, and so this would be used a handful of times during the year and primarily um, when the uh, refrigeration units that we talked about last time are brought into and out of the site. Um, so because that, that really greatly improves the maneuverability here. Um, and finally, uh, with the demolition of this portion of the building, um, the sort of driveway access in the front of the site, as well as the landscaping, we've been able to pull all of that further away from the road, which again, just improves some of the sight lines and visibility uh, from this driveway. Um, and that is some of the uh, site plan revisions. I also have some uh, summary of the other things that we submitted, but I'll pause there in case there's any questions about the specific, uh, those specific pieces. Uh, hearing none, I guess, uh, to move First, on. The hatch, the hatch marks on the demolished part of the building, that shows, um, that still shows that part of the building, right? It's, it's not gone yet, or, or is that after it's gone? Um, this is indicating where that portion of the building is today uh, that will be demolished. And so the, you see the, the light gray hatch would be new pavement. Um, and then the dark gray hatch is sidewalk connecting the building entrance to the um, parking lot over here. Um, so this is just a visual representation of both the demolition and the proposed work um, all in one plan. Okay. And so how far is the proposed new building, let's call it that? from the road? Um, so it would be uh, approximately uh, 58 or 60 feet um, in this new altered condition. Okay, thank you. Um, and so um, we were asked to um, provide additional documentation uh, in support of our request that the special, that the special permit be granted uh, to convert an existing non-conforming, to change an existing non-conforming use into a different non-conforming use. Um, and so uh, we 
pulled the permit records and other files that are held up at FERCOG um, and uh, submitted that uh, along with an explanation. But briefly, um, there were actually two special permits um, granted for the CNA repair shop. The first one in 1978, which occurred under the 1963 bylaw, uh, which is the four page bylaw that Deborah mentioned uh, last time. Um, essentially what that bylaw provided for was all land uses were allowed um, with the exception of a specific list that were allowed by special permit in all locations in town. Um, so at that time, um, this, uh, this use was allowed by special permit and that special permit was granted. There was an additional special permit in 1999 to add um, an extension onto this building for the same use. Uh, well, actually, I believe it's actually this portion of the building here, about 2,000 square feet of new showroom. And so that... De Deborah, you and I signed that in 19... That's correct. Did we really? 1999, okay. <laughs> Bob, Bob must have been elsewhere. <laughs> Russ, could you... The, the uh, 1978 special permit, that was under the bylaws of what date? 60 of 1963. The original bylaw. Okay. And I don't know if you mentioned it, but is that what was still in effect for the 1999 one or was uh, that all? No. So there was a major overhaul in 1987, which created a lot of the land uses and zones and restrictions that still exist today. That's been amended several times since then. Um, but that was by far the most comprehensive change. Okay. Thank you. And so under the current bylaw, the existing land use of the property that, that best fits in our opinion is the audio, the, sorry, not audio, automobile, vehicle, boat, and equipment sales and service, which is not allowed in the AR1 zone. And um, again, what we're requesting is a special permit um, for that uh, existing non-conforming use to be converted into a different non-conforming use, in this case, marijuana manufacturing, which is also not allowed in this zone. Um, and we've uh, you know, provided, a, a, again, more, a little bit more detailed um, justification for why we believe that um, the proposed project is not substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conformance. Um, we've provided some images uh, in that document of what the man marijuana manufacturing process typically looks like. And we'd also um, highlight the cleanup um, of the exterior of the site and the fact that, that the items for repair and or uh, salvage of parts uh, will be gone. And that overall, uh, these facilities, as I think everyone's well aware of now, are tightly controlled in terms of access um, and the, the processes and procedures for access and also what's going on inside the building are all heavily regulated and, and very carefully watched. If I can um, in there for a minute. Yes. So um, there was a lot of material coming in this week on our ZBA hearing tonight because we have four matters on the agenda. So I didn't get a chance mm -hmm. to share everything with my colleagues, but um, Chris did prepare a memo that he's summarizing right now, which is dated July 30th. So if I can just jump in, some of it's a little counterintuitive, but it does make sense. So what he's done is he's retraced the history of our town bylaws simultaneously with the history of the use of this particular property. And what he's essentially saying is that by the time in 1999 that we approved the addition by virtue of the amended 1987 bylaws, that lawnmower repair shop was no longer an allowed use, which we recognized because we allowed an addition to it in 1999. So hence he's concluding it was a legally existing non-conforming use two pieces there, not conforming, yes, but also legally existing because it predated the 87 bylaws, certainly. So 
with that in mind, then <clears throat> he's looking at the table uses. He's finding the closest use that would be permitted, which is the automobile, vehicles, boats, and equipment sales and service. Uh, just, just to clarify that last statement you made, um, that is the closest use to what is actually happening, but happening. is not permitted. Right. So what's happening now is not permitted. So that's illegally not performing use. And what they're trying to do, manufacturing uh, marijuana or processing marijuana, I should say, um, is not allowed in that zone unless they've got a non-conforming use, which they do. And then unless we're convinced, and he's probably about to make this part of the presentation, that under our 171.12b, <laughs> which regulates non-conforming uses, what this proposed change of a non-conforming use is something we should still approve. I'll let him, let him make the argument. But I just wanted to <laughs> lead up to it because if you haven't haven't read it, it's it's not doesn't roll off the tongue that easily. <laughs> Roger, I'll be able to use that as an attached document <laughs> rather than trying to write everything you just read. That it, it's you're reading it off print, so it, it exists as a. a it, document. Does, it does exist. I don't remember if Chris copied you on what he said to me or not, but I got it eventually. Okay. I believe I, and anything that I submitted uh, recently was to both Roger and Mary. Thank you. I, a lot came in, it sounds like. so. He... Oh, yes, all sorts of things. But I, I know I get, I, I am routinely copied on just about everything you send. So I expect one of those things was this. <laughs> my problem is that my Comcast email is like operating at 95% capacity. And God forbid if someone sends me pictures that, I get all these error warnings and I have to delete bunches of stuff that I've been saving. So I'm constantly juggling. And the same thing is if I, if I send them out, then it also puts me over the top. So sometimes I choose not to send things. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I think I, uh, I touched on um, some of the highlights um, in terms of appearance, noise, control of the site. Um, we do show uh, a small increase in traffic overall, but in this case, it's dedicated to employees um, who are coming at a specific time during the day and then staying on site for the rest of the time. Um, and uh, in terms of the purpose of sort of land use zoning is to ensure that non-congruous um, uh, land uses are not cited next to each other where they may have those impacts on one another. Um, and so if we look at uh, certainly the, the small engine repair operation in a, reg in a re uh, residential agricultural zone um, is out of place, which is why the zoning bylaw doesn't allow it here. Um, by comparison, uh, we would certainly argue that the marijuana manufacturing, which is the processing of an agricultural product, is, if anything, more in line um, with what's going on in this part of town, especially if we consider uh, the really large scale agricultural operations that are all occurring by right with, with no permit nearby. Um, and also the fact that we have the cannabis cultivation operation, not just at Seven River Road right behind us, um, but also uh, recently permitted an under construction facility just across the street, but in Hatfield uh, that Bernie Smirowski is as running. Um, and then, you know, the other really important provision in the bylaw uh, in reference to non-conforming use is that the proposed use um, not, I believe it's not increase the potential for groundwater pollution. Um, and so what we're proposing are processes that occur in a closed loop that don't have any discharges. Um, really the only water used on site is for domestic purposes as compared to the existing uh, repair shop where one must always be wary of the possibility of spilled fluids and oils and other things, especially from the items that come in in disrepair to begin with. Um, so sort of based on those facts, you know, the standard is not substantially more detrimental. Um, and, and, you know, our opinion to summarize is that uh, the proposed use is in fact less detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use. 
Is all of that stuff in, in your summary document too, Chris? Thanks. Yes, it is. Perhaps not in the exact same words, but. Right. <laughs> Um, and so I guess, you know, there's certainly going to be some discussion of, of that argument. Uh, the, the last few things that we submitted are actually pretty brief, so I can go through those real quick just to check them off. And then, um, and then I think uh, anything that I have prepared is, is through. Um, there was a question um, on the survey from a, a sharp-eyed member of the public that this town line on our plan is noted as approximate. And the question was, well, how accurate is it? Is the building, in fact, in Waitley? Um, if not, uh, do you need to get permits from Hatfields um, and, and why not show the actual town line? Um, and so, you know, we provided a bit of a the technical explanation, um, but the short version is that the town line as it officially exists is defined by two corner monuments, one of which is about 1200 feet to the east in a farm field, and the other one is about 9000 feet to the west. And it looks to us that a house was possibly built on it, if not very close to it. And in any case, um, it would be prohibitive to try to survey both of those points to establish the actual town line. What we did recover was what's known as a road stone, which purports to be the location of the town line at the edge of the road in this location that was surveyed. And then through um, the record of plans, GIS information and the location of that road stone, our surveyor placed the town line in his judgment um, as close as he could to the location of the actual town line in this plan and then marked it approximately because that is truly what it is at this point. Um, Mass GIS has published error data on their town lines of uh, typically around 12 feet that's before we include the evidence of the road stone, which probably makes that line a little bit more accurate. And now with the demolition of the portions of the building that I mentioned earlier, uh, the building is approximately 19, or is, it is 19 feet off of the approximate town line. And all of that said, uh, we did go to the Hatfield Planning Board last night to discuss this question of the accessory use of parking and uh, the existing use of storage and parking of materials and equipment associated with the repair business and the proposed use of driveway and parking and landscaping associated with the marijuana manufacturing business. And under their bylaw, they have a similar provision about non-conforming uses um, and used that issue of finding that uh, essentially for the purposes of what's being built in Hatfield approved the project in their eyes. Can you say that last half sentence again? It got cut out. Oh, sorry. Um, and so that uh, 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 Hatfield's planning board uh, issued a finding under their non-conforming use uh, bylaw that effectively approved our use of, of this area for what's shown on the plan. Okay. Um, and then finally, we submitted a copy of the lease and the host community agreement. Um, and then the planning board had requested some additional information on odor control. Um, and so we've uh, provided some information on that um, in terms of the, the carbon filtration units that'll be used to scrub the air before it's exhausted. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the planning board did approve us on the 27th. And that is all I had prepared to say, but we're certainly happy to address any more comments, questions uh, from the board. I had, uh, if you could back up to, let's see. Um, I have Sorry, I'm saying too many things too quickly for you, aren't I? No, I, I can't write and look things up in the in the in the zoning book right away at the same time. When you were giving the the your suggested uh, table of uses category yes. for the new the new use that you're going to be running under, which uh, I found one marijuana related thing. Yeah. What, what was the exact subject? It? it is, I, I'm gonna um, find it here to be certain, but uh, I believe it's called uh, Marijuana Manufacturer. 
Um, and that's actually lumped in with registered marijuana dispensary. Okay. And that's under light industrial uses. Light industrial. Okay, I'm seeing independent marijuana testing lab is, and then marijuana, uh, marijuana manufacturer or registered marijuana dispensary. I've got it. Yep. Yes. Roger. Yes. Um, should we have a copy of the Hatfield Planning Board's decision included in the record? I think it'd be a great idea, sure. Okay. Have they written it up? Um, we don't have a written decision at this point. No, uh, it happened last night. Right. It might be useful if you talked a little bit more about the odor control. I know the planning board approved it, but Sure. Our board is always interested in that. Sure. Well, and if you could, could you share your screen to show that um, the carpet filter uh, device yes. got there? Um, I believe I have here. Um, and so uh, what we provided is um, sort of a typical image and some uh, information on this. Uh, I, I will admit I'm not the expert on the mechanics, um, but this is uh, you know, obviously typical technology of, um, of carbon filtration with the activated carbon having a very high um, surface area um, and is attractive to uh, odor molecules. And so the air circulates through the device, which scrubs the odor out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important that the mechanical engineering size that airflow for a certain number of air changes um, to remove an appropriate level of odor. Uh, when appropriately designed, uh, it scrubs 99.9% .9 of particulate matter. It's actually unhealthy to create um, indoor air that scrubs to 100%. Um, this is uh, essentially the same product, just sized for a different space as what was proposed on the cultivation side um, on Seven River Road. Um, and then, you know, while odor is certainly an important concern in manufacturing, um, it is less than it is in the cultivation um, after these, not just because the product's been harvested and dried, but it remains packaged uh, in sealed containers and bags um, until the moment at which it comes out to be extracted. Um, and then in addition to sort of the, the nuts and bolts of what's being provided, uh, much as we did with the cultivation project, uh, we're just putting into the record uh, the things that DMCTC is agreeing to have its um, facilities manager do in terms of uh, calibration and testing and monitoring of these things to uh, ensure that they're continuing to operate the way they're supposed to be. Um, and then we've uh, provided some citations uh, about the, the applicability of uh, this sort of odor control to the um, to the cannabis industry. So if we were to make those uh, maintenance schedule items <clears throat> a condition of our permit, it sounds like the applicant would be agreeable to that. Uh, I'd like Jared to chime in, but I suspect he is. Yes, that sounds fine. Hey, Roger. Yes. I thought on, on other projects that we were looking at for con concerning odor control, I think especially on State Road, uh, the 
manufacturer proposed uh, submitting a plan to specifically say what odor control equipment would be installed. And I thought there was some agreement or understanding that after it was installed uh, within one year, we would have some uh, information on whether it's working or not. Is, is that something that we should be considering here for this installation and even others in town? I mean, he's, he's quoting a manufacturer specs here uh, for odor control, but what is actually going to be installed on the property? Do we know that? And I think we didn't know that on other installations and they said they would provide that once it, it is installed. And so I'll say that, that this is the type of equipment that's proposed. Um, the, the mechanical engineering for the building has not happened at this point yet, um, because uh, most especially because the special permit with the non-conforming use is, is discretionary. Um, but we're certainly uh, happy to provide that design information and or that information at the time of construction, whatever's appropriate. I, I do remember, Fred, what you're saying when we first approved on Christian Lane, and I think we wrote it into the, even though that that wasn't, that didn't end up being used. Right. Um, I think we wrote it into the permit that we were going to go down there again in odor season and, and actually check it out ourselves. Okay. But I think the one I'm referring to on, on State Road at LaSalle property, wasn't that a, a concern and were we putting conditions on that? I'm not sure I remember that one. I may have that decision here. Because I remember that the what manufacturer of the odor control was kind of giving us guidance on how to address that and maybe verify that at a later date. Just hold on a minute here. I guess the other thing, I don't think we have any experience in town on odor control. I mean, or odor period, because none of these places are, are operating yet in town. So, you know, everybody's proposing something, but we don't know if it's going to work here. You know, it works in other, other places and the manufacturer will tell you it works, but. Still looking. You know, I on uh, other special permits, we we've certain we've placed conditions where we've asked to come back within a year to the board and uh, let us know how things are operating, and I think that's been happening at one or two other locations, not, not on marijuana, but on noise levels and things like that, so. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree. I think that, I mean, it's, it, it's a significant issue that comes up with every one of these projects. And I do think we owe it to fellow citizens to make sure that the odor is controlled. All right, I have that decision. Let's see here. It attached an exhibit A to the LaSalle permit, exhibit A, which was called conditions. And it said an odor control plan is to be submitted before the beginning of operations to be endorsed by a professional engineer or a certified industrial hygienist. The plan must address one, standard operating procedures, two, 
a commitment to use the best available technology, BAT, and a description of the BAT plan for this location. Three, proposed questions for any complainants. And four, proposed protocols for responding to complaints. Anyway, that's that's the way it was written at that time. Okay, so if we're doing that for one establishment in town, should we, should we be doing it for every other one or all of them? Yes, certainly makes sense. Yeah, I agree. All right, so we could do that in addition to making their maintenance schedule, which they've agreed to a, a condition. Let's ask if there are any um, abutters or neighbors who are present and want to be heard. None? Okay. Oh, so the argument is, the essential argument is um, somewhat uniquely, even though the use is not allowed in this zone, if they were coming in and building a brand new building, for instance, because they have found a building that is a non-conforming uh, or con that building contains a non-conforming use, they're basically uh, seeking to be grandfathered in and change the use to another non-conforming use. And our bylaw seems to allow that if we conclude that this new use is not substantially, this is right, that word is in there, substantially, I'm trying to grab those words. Substantially more detrimental. There you go. I've, the new use is and, not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use, and it will not increase the danger of groundwater pollution or contamination. So- um, I, I didn't mention this uh, before, although I should have that. Um, we do have a recent precedent. Uh, Northampton has a similar provision in their bylaw about non-conforming uses. And we actually did get approval from their ZBA for a cannabis cultivation facility that took the place of a gravel pit um, with both of those uses occurring in a residential zone that did not allow either of them um, under the thinking that in that case, environmental impact and truck traffic and that sort of thing, that the new use was less detrimental. So there is some local precedent, obviously different by law, but similar language. All right, thank you for that. Yeah, so it's an interesting concept. It actually um, is a convincing one to me. I think the argument is, um, well taken. If it's, if it's a use, it's basically going to be fully contained in that building, and they're going to neaten up the site or straighten up the site, make it neater. Um, I don't see the harm. No, so, I, I would agree. I agree. And so the only real potential harm would be the owner. Of course, there's a grow operation right behind it. Um, be an interesting question. If you went there and you smelled an odor, where would the odor be coming from of those two uses? But I guess we, we can worry about that uh, at a later point. So, uh, and I will say, I did review the leasing material um, because we had an experience where an applicant actually did not have any legal arrangement with the owner of the property. So we're trying to avoid that going forward. And, and uh, the leasing material did satisfy me that there is a legal arrangement with the owner, although it's a fairly complicated arrangement because there's a, there's a lease, there's a sub lessee, and the sub lessee is turning around and leasing it to the operator. But um, be that as it may, I saw signatures that it exists. So um, I think we can check that one off. And yes, there's a host community agreement 
Now, wasn't there an earlier host community agreement for this site? Um, so this this has been complicated because DMCTC has three host community agreements for their three proposed operations, and each successive HCA mentions the previous ones. So there's an HCA for the grow facility, and then there's an HCA for this property that mentions the grow facility, and then the, the matter that's later mentions all three of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it does exist. So... Yeah, I would, I would be in favor of it. We just have to make sure we write up the conditions uh, properly. And um, other comments from the board before we actually proceed to... Oh, uh, can, can somebody refresh my memory on the Christian Lane? Did we not state that we were going to go and, and physically check it in terms of the odor. It, I mean, that, that's a project that never got off the ground, but we had approved it. And I, I, I am mindful that that's, that comes up again and again and again, that people are concerned about that. And I, I think we should have, um, I'm just admitting somebody from the waiting room, um, that when we write those conditions, it sounds like we're leaning toward granting this, and I'm certainly leaning toward that myself that we really do have to have um, something in place so that we can be stringent about that. I mean, I, so that you know, we don't have residents saying that this is unlivable. Just the way we did way, way back with Yankee Candle. And even when we impose sort of odor control with them, I mean, we can all smell it when we go by in the summertime. I don't remember Deborah, but my memory's not perfect that we ourselves volunteered to go back within a year because- They have to come to us. It was something like that, Roger, that they had to come to us within a year and to see, and if we had any concerns from the public that that would be, that was a condition, that we were gonna review the permit in a year. Well, that might've been the case. I think it might've been somewhere along that. I think you're right, Deborah, on the- I think it's about reviewing it in a year that yeah. we ask them to come back. And we did something similar with Quan Quant because there was such a concern about the right. noise. noise. Right. And so in this case, I mean, and, and that was a legitimate concern. People were very, very worried about the potential noise. And I and now tonight we don't have people expressing that, but certainly at the beginning of all this, and Fred has brought it up, there was a lot of concern about the smell. Well, again, I think that Fred's points before are really important because we're now on our, I don't know, fourth, fifth marijuana mm -hmm. approval, and we have absolutely zero experience. evidence yeah. that, and experience that any of this works. Right. And I, once again, submit to you that I am troubled by that. Mm -hmm. I hope it does. But what if it doesn't? I and hope it does, too. I mean, I absolutely hope it does too, but I'm wondering if we might want to consider as one of those conditions that we review it in a year with regard to the odor control. I think we should. I think we should. Well, yeah, that's okay. So then um, we could put that into the <clears throat> exhibit A conditions a year from what? A year from start of operations? Uh, yeah, I, I yes. guess, yes. Um, Just making but, a note. One, one year from when they submit the plan of how they're addressing odor control, maybe. Well, don't we just, didn't we just look at that plan? No, he, he means the control plan. Oh, I, okay, I'm sorry, I see, all right. Right, so the way that, that first condition on the exhibit A is written for the other applicant, says an odor control plan is to be submitted before the beginning of operations. So yes, we can measure it from the date that that original plan is, odor control plan is submitted. Because um, presumably they would be submitting that, let's say on the same, you know, in the same month of when they begin operations. So sure, that could be the measuring point. Okay. Good idea. All right, so one year. All right, so why don't I 
make a motion to close the public dialogue portion of the meeting. Second. Okay. And then I'll proceed to um, say that I would be in favor of voting um, to allow the application as uh, proposed on the amended plan with the really two sets of conditions. The first set being that they adhere to the maintenance schedule and we'll spell that out by just picking up the carbon filter maintenance schedule in their uh, additional submission for tonight. That'd be the first part. And then the second part would be that we have the same conditions on the exhibit A for the LaSalle project with the additional requirement that one year after the odor control plan is submitted, there'd be a, another hearing to see how things are going, see if there have been any complaints. Just to check in with the board, but that would be their requirement to schedule it with us. With those conditions, I would vote in favor. With those conditions, as Roger enumerated, I would vote in favor. Okay, well then it's the that <laughs> the application is allowed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, we do want to see the um, the Hatfield memo. Yes. Was that a vote that we just had? I mean, it, everybody was sort of conditioning it, but I I would did did was it approved as? Yes, that was yeah. a vote. Yes. <laughs> um, and yeah, we'll be sure to submit the uh, the Hatfield approval. Okay, great. Anybody here from AT and T? Yep, I am here. Hello. Just give us a minute. No problem. Take your time.
Anything else need more time? No, I'm good. All right. All right, well, so Mary, this is a, a new hearing. Why don't you read the legal notice? Legal notice, Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Waitley. Notice is hereby given that the town, that the Zoning Board of Appeals of Waitley will hold a public hearing on Thursday, August 5th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. The hearing will take place virtually via Zoom. The rules of decorum for a public hearing remain in effect and the chairperson will seek comments from the public when appropriate to do so. On June 24th, 2021, Allison Hebel, agent for AT&T at Centerline Communications, LLC, applied to amend an existing special permit to allow modifications at the existing wireless telecommunications facility located at Christian Lane, map and parcel number 19009A and owned by American Tower Corporation. Application for the special permit amendment is to be considered under the provisions of Waitley zoning bylaws as provided by Mass General Laws Chapter 40A. This notice is also published electronically on www.recorder.com slash public dash notices and www.masspublicnotices.org. And then the access information for the computer link or the phone numbers follow that. Signed Roger P. Lipton Chair, Zoning Board of Appeals. And this notice ran in the Greenfield Recorder on July 22nd and 29th. Okay, Ms. Hebel, any objections to the way that was written and published? Nope, that sounds accurate. Okay, so then why don't you tell us uh, what you're asking uh, us to approve and why we should approve it? Sure. Um, so AT&T is going to be performing modifications to their existing equipment on the existing cell tower. So they are going to be replacing three antennas. They're going to be adding three additional antennas um, on the same mount. Um, they'll be replacing three remote radio units, which are the smaller devices that go behind the antennas. And they'll be adding six additional of those remote radio units. Uh, they'll also be adding a surge arrester, which is the same thing as a surge protector with the associated cables that go with that. Um, they will not be expanding the compound and they will not be increasing the height of the tower. So everything will be um, in conformance with how the, the tower looks um, and, and the compound is as it is right now. So if someone was driving by or walking by, <clears throat> it's fair to say they wouldn't notice anything that changed? There will be four antennas on each sector, but the mounts are already there. So it's not that they're not going to increase at all. So unless they know that there's three right now, they would then just see a fourth, but it's not going to be anything, you know, um, outrageous. Okay. It sounds fairly routine. Anything else you want to add? Yep. No, nope, that's pretty much it. Like I said, they're not increasing anything, um, just performing maintenance and modifications to upgrade to the most recent technologies. Okay. Any members of the public here uh, who wish to be heard? No. Okay, well, I don't think we need to prolong this. Um, I, I just have one question. Um, I'm I'm sorry, Ms. Hebel, you're you're you are breaking up a little bit. So mm -hmm. they're replacing three and adding three. Correct. So does that go to six? So there's going to be a total of twelve on there. Okay. There and is currently a total of nine on the. Okay. Uh, yep. So three are going to come down, and they're going to replace those, and then there'll be three additional. Okay. So, so total of twelve. Yep. Nine four. from nine to twelve. Okay. Yep. Correct. Okay, that's that's my only question. All right, well, so the, unless there are any other questions, I'll move that we close the public dialogue portion of the hearing. Second. <laughs> okay, and I would vote to approve the application as presented without any conditions, uh, just approve it as is. I, I also would vote in that in that way. I vote to approve. 
Okay, that's it. Unanimous. It's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Roger, by the way, aren't we prohibited from disapproving anyway? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> they say federal law governs? Well, I, th I mean, I thought that that was in part of the um, thing that she sent. Up. Uh, it did say that, that you, that local boards cannot block. I got the same impression when I looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, remember way back when we were the, the canary in the coal mine for approving a cell tower? Yeah, and the ham radio <laughs> towers. I mean, all of which is controlled outside of, of the local right. Social Board of Appeals. Okay. We then need to take an eight-minute uh, break until the yep. eight o'clock. Okay. Sounds good to me. Eight-minute break. Okay. I shall... I, I'm going to keep things going, but I'm turning off my camera. I'm going to mute mine. Where am I? Um, Roger and Deborah, um, just sort of before this begins, if if this should continue into September, September second is the next scheduled meeting. My granddaughter is scheduled to arrive in this world that day. Uh -huh. um, so I just wanted you to know ahead of time that it would be important for Fred and Kristen to. Um, so that there could be continuity just in case, because um, I'll tell you where I would rather be. Of course. <laughs> does, does your granddaughter have a name yet? Yes, her name is Nancy Francis. Oh, what a beautiful name. I, I'm, you know, that's so, I'm very fond of Nancy. My, two of my dearest friends have that name. <laughs> Uh, Na Nancy is is my daughter in law's grandmother, and uh, Francis. Uh, we're going to spell it with the typically masculine is ending. That that was my father's name. So. Oh, beautiful! That's wonderful. All right, it's a little bit after eight. <clears throat> Mary, if you're ready. Um... <clears throat> read the legal notice. Legal notice. Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Waitley. Notice is hereby given that the Zoning Board of Appeals of Waitley will hold a public hearing on Thursday, August 5th, 2021 at 8 p.m. The hearing will take place virtually via Zoom. The rules of decorum for a public hearing remain in effect and the chairperson will seek comments from the public when appropriate to do so. On July 14th, 2021, Debilitating Medical Condition Treatment Centers, Inc. applied for a special permit to become a marijuana retailer in an existing commercial building located at 424 State Road, Unit B, Sugarloaf Shops, and owned by Yankee Candle Company, Incorporated. Application for the special permit is to be considered under the provisions of the Waitley Zoning Bylaws as provided by Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A. This notice is also published electronically on www.recorder.com slash public dash notices and www.publicnotices.org. Uh, the access, meeting access information follows that and it's signed Roger P. Lipton Chair, Zoning Board of Appeals, July 22nd and 29th. All right, so who's here for the petitioner? Uh, I'm Chris Chamberlain, a uh, civil engineer with Berkshire Design Group, uh, representing Debilitating Medical Condition Treatment Centers, Inc., which, as I always say from now on, will be referred to as DMCTC for ease of my verbal uh, skills. Uh, Any we are objections, Chris, to the way that legal notice was written and published? Uh, no objections. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so uh, DMCTC is proposing to um, uh, construct uh, marijuana retail uh, at 424 State Road Unit B, um, most recently occupied by the Yankee Candle Real Estate Office. Um, the building was also uh, used by Bay State Health Medical uh, Offices. Um, if uh, Let's see if I... You are co-host, Chris. Great. Thank you. 
Um, so a site I imagine all of the board members are quite familiar with. Um, this is the Sugarloaf Shops property um, at the corner of 116 and Route 5. Um, what's, what you see here is the neighborhood plan that the zoning requires us to uh, submit in terms of um, uses nearby, but we'll flip um, right now to uh, the site plan to orient ourselves. Um, um, Chris, could you, yes. Mary, could you please give me the date on this one? Uh, I yes. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> this appears to be May 10th. Instead. Thank you. So um, DMCTC um, has an agreement to purchase uh, this building here from Yankee Candle, which is part of a three unit condo that occupies the Sugarloaf Shops area. Uh, this is unit B. Unit A is a, another um, 8,000 square foot uh, building and unit C is a small uh, storage building. Um, these buildings are all part of a condominium. Um, the, uh, the occupancy of the buildings themselves is by the, each individual member of the condominium, but uh, the remainder outside the buildings is all common area and shared. Uh, the property is located in the commercial zone and overall the, um, exist, the exterior of the site will remain uh, virtually unchanged, although there'll be extensive renovation on the interior of the building. The, um, this uh, Unit B building is a total of 8,000 square feet, um, of which 3,100 square feet would be converted for marijuana retail, which is the former real estate office. The remainder of the building is uh, being actively marketed for commercial tenants at the time um, and with a specific emphasis on uh, general office uh, type tenants. Um, as I flip back to this plan, uh, again, we've listed um, all of the land uses that occur within a thousand feet of the proposed marijuana establishment and are also showing for reference the 500 foot boundary uh, within which there are some excluded land uses. Um, within the 1,000 foot buffer, there is this property on the corner, which at least uh, at some point has been a daycare. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it uh, remains active, but it is outside of the 500 foot boundary. And so that is uh, um, not impacting the ability to use uh, this site. Hey, Chris, I have a question. When you yes. say um, the remainder of the building is being marketed for offices, is it marketed by, by who, the current owner or, or by you? So uh, oh. DMCTC would purchase the building and then would uh, intend to lease the remaining space to a new tenant. Um, and office use, I believe, would be by right in this zone. Anything else, almost anything else would be by special permit. And so there, there is no prospective tenant at this time. Okay. Um, and the bylaw also limits marijuana establishments to a maximum of 5,000 square feet. This is a 3,000 square foot uh, or 3,100 square feet is proposed to be the store. Um, and so I'm going to highlight uh, just some of the, the key factors of the site plan. Uh, obviously, we're not proposing new site construction for the most part. So um, uh, we'll, we'll just highlight the existing components that, that we feel are most relevant to this application. Um, in terms of lighting and security, which are obviously always very important, um, site lighting is uh, proposed to remain unchanged. Um, as with any of these uh, marijuana projects, there's obviously an intensive security plan uh, to be developed. Uh, it'll include, as is typical, infrared cameras that can operate uh, with just ambient light and without the need for artificial lighting. Uh, there's the ability for remote monitoring. There'll be security staff uh, on site when the store is open and available 24 hours a day, um, even in off hours. Uh, DMCTC reached out and had a verbal conversation with the police chief about this site um, and uh, of course, and uh, will of course be working with the police department uh, and seeking their approval for the particulars of the security plan. Um, but uh, 
as we've done with, with these marijuana establishments more and more, um, the, the, de the specific details of a lot of that security plan uh, is better to keep confidential um, for those security reasons. Um, in terms of noise and odor, uh, the noise levels of a, um, of a marijuana retailer, uh, we liken to be very similar to that of a general retail, uh, which is the sort of thing that you would expect in the commercial zone in a, in a building like this. Um, so we, we don't see that as um, unusual in terms of the potential for a special permit use here. Odor, of course, is, um, it is, I will note, significantly less of an issue than it would be for a cultivation or even a manufacturing product uh, project. Um, in particular, a lot of the products that are sold in these retail establishments um, have just the oils that are extracted from the plant material, which carry little to no odor with them. And additionally, the, the products with flour, which do have the potential for odor, are, um, are generally packaged and sealed um, from the time they arrive until the time they are sold and leave. That said, um, odor is certainly important for the comfort of employees and customers inside. And obviously there's an obligation to mitigate that in terms of outside. Um, there is a proposal, for, just like with, with all these projects that the indoor air um, be scrubbed with uh, odor control, uh, uh, mechanical equipment, um, and that air will be circulated through and filtered um, for, uh, before uh, it's vented. Um, and, oh, and I'm, uh, I'm getting a message from Jared that there was a follow-up meeting with Chief Savine of the police department today, um, and uh, he had no additional comments or concerns at this time related to the plan. Signage on the site uh, is going to be very similar to the previous businesses. Um, as per the bylaw, uh, we'll take advantage of the ability to have one wall sign um, on the building, as well as make use of the existing freestanding sign, which previously identified the businesses associated with this building. Um, those would be in their existing locations, um, existing materials, um, and uh, compliant with the bylaw. Um, as stated. And so then I want to turn to traffic, which uh, certainly is uh, an important topic um, at, on this particular site, which is a very busy part of town. So we took a look at um, assessing the traffic numbers as compared to the existing use um, based on uh, the Institute for Transportation Engineers Manual. Um, and what it turns out is that while ITE has started to include these marijuana uses in their manual, uh, the data are not robust at this point. Um, it's based on four data points from Colorado and Oregon, which may or may not be representative, um, but they also show no correlation between the size of the store and the traffic. In fact, the two largest stores that they studied had the two lowest levels of traffic. Um, so while we did um, look at that in terms of average or gut feel reasons. Um, it didn't seem appropriate to try to base that analysis strictly on the um, ITE materials. So we looked at um, similar uses that, in our opinion, are most likely to match with uh, the traffic patterns that we're going to see here, other more general, uh, more typical uh, retail uses with a history. And um, based on our analysis, the existing traffic at the site, uh, I'm sorry, not specifically for the site, we'll talk about the site as a whole in just a moment, but for this facility, for this building, the previous uses would have generated uh, average traffic on a weekday of 220 trips. And this is where I point out that trips specifically means one entrance or one exit. So in terms of sort of number of visitors, we take the half of that number if you want a visual. Um, and so that 220 uh, is estimated to increase to about 360 trips per day, again, with half of those entrances and half of those exits. Um, and um, based on sort of what we've seen uh, from what little we can tease out from some of these stores that have been open, you know, that's consistent with something on the order of 100 to 150 uh, customers a day. Um, and there's sort of, I think, 
we're all a little bit aware of this, but there, there are two tiers of these marijuana retailers. There's the Netta as the first mover, as well as Theory and Great Barrington, which is right next to New York and Connecticut that see quite a lot of foot traffic. And then the remaining stores um, have been have shown a history of having significantly less um, people coming in and out than, than those sort of, um, I guess I'd call them flagships. I'm not sure what, what word to use. Excuse me, Chris. Uh, yes. Gary, uh, the estimate of increase uh, you said was going to take it from 220 trips per day to what figure? 360. Um, and that's in the documents that we submitted also. Thank you. Um, and that's um, average throughout the day. Um, looking at the peak hour trips, uh, the, the previous uses um, in the peak hour weekday had a total of 32 trips in our estimate, which would increase to 52 trips or a change of about 20 or to sort of uh, put that in a, in a perspective, one new trip about every three minutes, either into or out of the site. Now, the unit B on its own is also not the most important necessarily way to look at the traffic here, although that does give an in indication of what the increase may be. Um, but looking at this site as a whole, um, in particular, um, there was a lot of concern uh, about the left turn onto 116. Um, and just to run through a couple of the other movements, um, entering this site, um, the site is uh, approachable from three directions, north on five, south on five, and from the east on 116. The site can be entered with a right turn from any of those directions. Uh, to exit the site, um, uh, the, you can take a right turn to go Route 5 north. Uh, if you're going Route 5 South, you can actually exit from Old State Road and take a right and then use the light to get a left. Um, so we really did focus on the one necessary left turn to uh, leave the site, which is from Old State Road onto 116. And so if we take the peak hour trips for the site as a whole, considering the fact that uh, in Unit A, we have uh, Toro Verde, which is a permitted marijuana establishment, which is going to have similar traffic patterns, we would think, to DMCTC's facility. And the fact that both of these buildings have extra space that may be leased out to additional tenants, uh, we took both of those marijuana uses as well as assuming an office use in the remaining space, which again is a by right use. So that could go in without any further uh, consideration from the town and um, estimated that uh, out of those total trips that about one sixth of them would be the left turns onto 116, given that that's uh, essentially one sixth of the possible movements. Um, and we concluded that the gap between each of those moves is uh, approximately three minutes between each vehicle attempting to turn left onto 116. Um, and I highlight all of that because this came up at the planning board uh, as well as previous projects is that, you know, we, we understand that that's a difficult geometry. Um, the, you know, it was discussed at the planning board and pointed out that in the past when this location has been uh, brought up, uh, it's a state highway and there's very little that anybody can do to change anything there. Uh, the highway supers confirmed on a previous project that we can't so much as put a stop sign there uh, without the Commonwealth uh, deeming it appropriate. Um, so while we're not proposing any changes there, I did want to give perspective to you know how much this site is producing um, in that area. And then um, finally on traffic, we also suggest that um, previous projects have been approved in different towns, including Waitley, with a provision that police details uh, at the expense of the applicant uh, be provided from the time of opening until the police department uh, feels that it's, it's no longer necessary to help for the safe and efficient movement of traffic. Um, and, and we're certainly amenable to a condition like that um, if, if the board feels it's appropriate. And then um, relatedly looking at parking on the site. So again, this is a condominium uh, with these multiple uh, businesses representing members of that condo association. 
There are 87 parking spaces on site that are part of the common space and shared among all of the users. Um, again, had uh, what we wanted to do here was, excuse me, uh, second special permit hearing, I'm starting to dry out a little bit, I apologize. Um, we wanted to look at this site as a whole when it's fully operational to look at that parking impact um, to make sure that, that we can feel comfortable about what's been going on. And so looked at the site, uh, if there are two marijuana retailers in each of these buildings, as well as office uses in the remaining space, what would that mean? Again, ran into that issue that, that there is not a lot of robust data on uh, the marijuana retailers and parking. It's the same four data points, I think, that they used for the traffic estimate. Um, so, uh, you know, after we had a long discussion with the planning board, I wrote this up more formally and, and submitted it earlier this week to the ZBA. But we looked at the uh, parking demand from a couple of different angles using ITE data, using uh, for the marijuana use, uh, using ITE data for other land uses that we feel are comparable. Um, using the traffic numbers that I just mentioned to try to tease out what's a reasonable number for parking there. Um, and each of those methods came up with a total uh, peak parking demand of between um, 50 and 60 spaces out of the 87 total that are on site. And then as a fourth method, as sort of a reality check, is what if we're just grossly underestimating um, the, the marijuana generation of traffic uh, parking demand. Um, so we took the marijuana portion of that use and said, let, let's say we underestimated it 50% um, and ran the numbers again uh, and came up with sort of what I'm calling a reasonable worst case uh, of those uses of a parking demand of 72 spaces out of the 87 that are available. So while there's certainly some uncertainty there, uh, I will be the first to admit that, that there are other interpretations of those numbers. We tried to do the best we can to come up with, with something that made sense. But overall, um, it does seem like uh, the, the site is able to support uh, the, the proposed special permit use in light of what's there now and what could be put in by right. And then, um, you know, the last couple of things that I did want to mention is that recently the town of Waitley has submitted a grant application for some funding to go to a planning study for this portion of town uh, with the interest of uh, creating more uh, commercial activity here, have more business to, to move in, and how to make that uh, easier. And so, you know, that says to us that that a uh, use that wants to bring a retail store in um, is really uh, congruent with what the town is looking to do in this part of town. Um, and then we also were at the planning board last week on Tuesday on the 27th to present site plan review. Uh, and we did receive approval for the site plan review um, with a couple of conditions, which I, I should have made note of, but uh, they included um, you know, coordination with the police department and approval of the, the safety plan. Um, and uh, there was another condition. I'm actually struggling to, to remember it at the moment. Um, so that's that's the overview of the site, um, and we're certainly happy to take any uh, questions or comments. There's uh, a couple of things that I applaud Chris for uh, looking at, to trying to use ITE rates and uh, also looking at other establishments around the area to see what traffic they generate. I think that was a good effort to do that. The, uh, I guess, comment or concern I have is, is uh, you only own the building. You're buying the building, not the parking lot, not the parcel. What coordination have you done with the owner of the parcel to know that what you're proposing will will fit in with uh, his use of the uh, parking spaces. Is that any coordination like that been been made with the owner of the parcel? He's the one that's going to control or do something. I assume with parking. 
Um, so the, the parking is controlled by the condo association um, and uh, you know, the, the condo documents uh, address how um, the parking is used. Um, and and our, my understanding is that, that it is shared equally among the site. As to direct coordination, I have to defer to Jared, but. Um, yeah, the, the parking is held in common. Um, but I understand that, but if, uh, if there's gonna be, if, if it ever comes to be an issue with parking, uh, you're the owner of the building, you're gonna say, well, you're gonna deal with the owner of the parcel because he maintains and controls the parking. That's his responsibility. So if he isn't aware or agreeable with what you're proposing for parking in the law, I, I mean, we're, we're gonna be at a standstill. Uh, how do we address that in the future? I, I think there should be some kind of agreement or we call it memorandum understanding or something between the, uh, the uh, proposed building uses, either one or, or two uses here, and, and the owner of the parcel that he's, uh, I guess, agreeable with, with what you're proposing to develop there and that the parking would be adequate or he would take measures to either control it or improve it. Wait, let me uh, jump in. Just uh, doing real estate law, when you have a condominium, there's no third party owner of the parcel owners of the individual condominium units own the land, the real estate, including the parking lot in common with their other co-owners. So when Jared says, or maybe it's Chris, the condominium association owns the land, that's true. And that means it's like a democracy. You have to vote, you have to have annual meetings or even more frequent meetings. And, um, <clears throat> decide by majority rule about what happens. It's, but normally the, the bylaws that are created when the condominium is created address that in, in one way or another. If, if, I, if I may, Chairman, um, you're 100% right. The, the common area is, uh, is owned by all. Our, our group, which owns, the, uh, which owns the other building, controls uh, and it's been deeded controls 50.25% of the common area. So we have controlling interest in the common area. Uh, to your point, there has been no discussion about parking and no contact made from this group with, with me in, uh, in, regards to, uh, in, regards, in regards to how we're gonna handle the, uh, the parking situation. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here for the long haul. I was here before Yankee Candle bought their building. My group, uh, my 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 group bought our building on the uh, on the north side of the project, and uh, we we intend to be here for for uh, for quite some time. But we do control the small retail building, which has uh, which Chris said earlier was a storage building. Uh, it's really not a storage building. There has been an ice cream vendor in there. There have been uh, Christmas trees sold out of there. There've been wreaths sold out of there, knickknacks sold out of there. And that is a 900 square foot building. That's approximately 30 by 30. And uh, that, that, that's building C and has not been taken into account in this parking issue of a uh, hundred and um, I think every 150 square feet of retail uh, needs one parking space. So there are uh, six parking spaces there uh, in that building that uh, no one has addressed. So, uh, uh, that's, uh, I hope that answers your questions. So is there something that needs to be done with, with uh, an agreement with the parking or, or the condo association or wherever you want to sit and you want to call it here that they are, I don't know, agreeable with the parking being proposed or uses being proposed for parking? Can I just, uh, sorry, I'm, my name is Isaac Fleischer. I'm, I'm counsel with uh, DMC. And um, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I just want to make sure we're really clear on how a condo association operates. Um, once DMC purchases their unit, they're part of the condo association. So it, it's not that DMC wouldn't enter into an agreement with the condo association, but rather all unit holders own 
in common 100% of the common spaces. It's not, it's, it's not parceled out uh, by percentage. And there's, there's bylaws that will govern how decisions are made. Um, if the condo association chooses to, uh, to set up some sort of parking plan, they, they certainly could, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be required. And there'd be, and there'd be no way for DMC to do that prior to acquiring the property. Condo, the condo association, the condo association is already set up. It's deeded with the property. And as I said, our group owns 50.25% of the, the, the condominium uh, association and, and the, and the common area. So our, our, uh, we would we would like to look at the proposal. We were you know no one no one brought it to us before. Uh, I'm I'm skeptical about how the parking would work, uh, but this is this is not something that just happened yesterday. This condo association was was uh, put together uh, uh, some you know decades ago, and uh, long before I bought the property, and uh, so um, it's it's already set up. It's already in the works. And uh, I just uh, would like to let everyone know that. So it's, 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 it's on record, it's in the registry of deeds. If the town has an issue with park with parking or traffic, they're gonna go to the condo association then, right? I, I, would, I would think so. Okay. So, I guess it, it, it's all this have to be tied in with, with this, with the permit here, the use permit, Roger, or? Well, I know. We, approved, we approved the prior unit. I don't recall us making any special um, carve out for their parking rules. I understand now the intensity of the, parking would be increased, but I guess the, the threshold question is whether 87 spots is enough to handle everything that's going on there, A, unit A, unit B, and unit C. Um, and I suppose it's just an open question that we're, we're gonna have to decide. Um, no, we didn't make any kind of a carve out for parking with the other business, but I don't think we anticipated that this, an identical business would be there that could have a, a large parking impact um, and a large traffic impact. And it, it might, it might for a while until things calm down. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm just kind of thinking out loud with that though. Well, why don't we continue with the hearing? I, know there, <clears throat> I received emails that the um, Tour of Tour of Verde group wants to be heard tonight, so mm -hmm. I, I'm sure they're going to be heard. And it's Roger, important. can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, John, is there a huge for sale sign on the corner of the property? Yes. So, does that mean that your interest? in the property or the whole property is for sale or the condo association. Could you just clarify that for me? Um, the building on the south side of the property, I believe is for sale that's owned by Yankee Candle. And that's the one uh, that DMC has, uh, has an interest in. Okay. Roger, do you see we have a hand up? Um, I can't see that. Yes. Somebody named Dick. Could you please identify your first and last name? Hi, I'm I'm Dick Evans. I'm the Northampton lawyer and uh, representing uh, Toro Verde, who is the uh, the prospective or the, the tenant in the in the northerly building. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I could I do a screen share here? I yes. can do that for you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Nope, that's not it, sorry. Um, uh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. How how do I do it? Um, you you do have up our our general regulations for parking and loading. What okay. Oh, oh, those are up. Okay. Good. Yes. Good. 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 Well, perfect. thank you. That's what okay. I that's what I wanted. I, I didn't realize they're up. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to talk about parking, and that's all I'm going to talk about. Uh, this first page just lays out the pertinent uh, provisions from the bylaws that relate to parking in this case. Uh, the first, the general regulation uh, requires uh, 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 one space per 150 feet of uh, gross floor area in, uh, in, uh, for, for retail stores. And in the, the marijuana regulations, uh, 171.28.6, requires in the parking section that the entire property comply with these requirements. Well, those are the key words there, entire property. Uh, well, that makes sense as a message to myself, uh, less full occupancy of the building uh, cause an overflow of parking. So what is the entire property that's, that, that we're talking about here? This is the, uh, the plan that's on record in the registry, but it's, it was recorded in 94, part of the Master Deed. It's kind of hard to read, so I, I highlighted Building B here, which is the one that debilitating proposes to go into. But I, just to clarify this, I've also highlighted Buildings A and C, simplified the plan a little bit, and rotated it 90 degrees, so north is north, uh, Route 5, Route 116, this is the way we're used to seeing it, and then took a look at the square footage of each building. Now, each of the buildings is a separate condominium, uh, as been said. Each contains, uh, at least A and, C and B contain two floors, upper and lower, and both are, are approved within the master dean and so forth for retail and office use. Uh, I, my understanding is that the lower level of building A is used for storage, and 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 there's no there's no second level at C, and that the lower some of the units in Building B have been used for various purposes. So if we if we look at both levels in all buildings, then the total number of square feet for all three buildings comes to about thirty thousand, and we divide that by one hundred and fifty comes up to 199 or about 200 uh, spaces for the entire condo. Well, that's an exorbitant number. There's nowhere close to that. Here's what I count as being the actual number of spaces on the site. Um, this, is, this is plus or minus, I could be off one or two here, but, and these are the four handicapped spaces right here. So there appear to be around 84 uh, sites parking spaces on the site right now. Now, if we, let's disregard the, uh, the lower level, just assume it doesn't exist, and then apply the, the, the one space per each 150 foot rule. Well, in that case, building A, 8,000 square feet would require this many spaces built so forth. And you can see we need, just, just, to, just considering the first floor of each of the buildings, we still need 107 parking spaces for this, this uh, project. I mean, for this uh, entire condo. <coughs> well, there's only 84 there now. Uh, Toro Verde has already uh, got a permit for building A for their 8,000 square feet, which, 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 which uh, it seems to me constitutes an implicit allotment of uh, 54 spaces to a uh, building A, which only leaves 30. Uh, debilitating needs about 50, 51, and that means they're short 21 spaces. So the bottom line is there is simply not sufficient parking on this site to meet the criteria for a special permit. And for that reason, I would urge the board, board not to approve this permit. Now, I know that's kind of a technical problem, and, and I, you know, maybe this can be worked out, and I hope it can, and certainly my client is, you know, we're willing to to be cooperative there. Uh, but I wanna make another point here and that relates 
to the whole neighborhood. Think about what's going to happen if this project, these two dispensaries or these two retail operations, what if they are as successful as we all hope they will be? Um, it's likely in that case, then both buildings will want to use some of their lower level space. And what's going to happen then? Will, will, will they have to come back to, to, to this board for variances? Would they qualify for a variance if they wanted to use the lower space? Um, does this permit, would this permit preempt uh, both buildings from using uh, the lower space? Uh, are we relegating the owners of both buildings to using the lower spaces for permanent storage, uh, notwithstanding that their deed says they can use both floors for, for retail and office? Well, this is a remarkable situation, frankly. I think this may be the first case on the East Coast where two large retail marijuana stores are located right next to each other on a very busy intersection. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's a remarkable thing. And I, I don't think it's happened anywhere else. Uh, certainly this means that the Toro Verde and debilitating are gonna be marketing to the max. Um, they're gonna be in great competition. And, and presumably the, the harder they compete, the more people will be drawn to the plaza and both as customers and as tenants. And, and, and if that's the case, then we've got some rocky shoals lying ahead because it doesn't look like with the existing parking the way it is, there could be a lot of conflict and a lot of controversy and a lot of confusion in the future with regard to the use of this uh, plaza. So um, we respectfully ask the board to take a really close look at this parking situation uh, in, uh, in relation as, as uh, section Seth, the criteria uh, says here, uh, uh, in relation to the neighborhood and the town, uh, in relation to the site adjacent and the town, because the town could be caught in the big dispute here if, if things don't work out right. So that's what I've got to say about parking. And thank you very much for uh, your listening to me. And I think some other members of the Toro Verde team would like to, to have a word with you too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Would you like me to take this down, Roger? Unless the next, well, cool. let's just set up a sequence here. <clears throat> so the tour of yeah. people can speak. I don't know if they need this screen or not. Mary would like to know if we have a copy of this document that's been sent to us already for the record. Uh, no, but I'd be happy to share it. Thank you. Certainly. Would it be possible for DMC to respond to any of that before uh, more uh, more people from Torre Verde uh, submit their comments? Well, so that's what I wanted to address as an orderly sequence. Um, if you want to do that now, I would say that would make sense since it's fresh in our mind. Yeah, thank you. I think so. Um, so... You know, certainly there were a lot of ifs there and uh, we don't know necessarily what the future of this site's going to be. Um, all we can do is try to gather the best data available and, and project it, which is uh, you know, what, what we try to do in engineering. Um, I'll note that uh, you know, we do these sorts of analyses all the time. Typically basement spaces are not counted as, uh, as uh, active use. When, especially when projecting future potential uses. Um, in addition to that, the bylaw actually caps the size of the store, so they won't be able to grow um, significantly larger than that unless the zoning is changed at town meeting. Uh, Dick, uh, I got 87, I, maybe it is 84, but I, I, think, I think 87 based on the striping that I saw, either way, in the same ballpark. Um, and I agree that that is less than zoning requires for these buildings. Um, it's always been that way, that uh, whenever this project was approved, it was approved with less parking than the zoning requires. Um, that zoning, I'll note, does require one space per 150 square feet for retail. It also requires one space for 150 square feet of office, which is a by right use that can go in without a special permit, without any review by the town. Um, so from that perspective, the site is already underparked based on the bylaw, and that's just a product of sort of American zoning bylaws are 
written based off of very large parking ratios that tend not to show up. Um, a lot of more modern zoning actually takes into account that much less parking is needed than, than some of the sort of 1970s era planning documents where a lot of that is joined. But uh, so we agree that the parking on this site has not, does not, and will not in the future uh, meet the letter of the bylaw. But um, all we can do is try to um, conservatively project what the parking demand is going to be um, to demonstrate that, uh, that we believe it's adequate for um, the, the uses that are actually uh, being proposed. That's what I would say. And I, I just, I wanna add that this, per, this special permit application is for uh, a 3,100 square foot facility. Uh, I, I believe Toro Verde's permit is for a 5,000 square foot facility. So uh, I don't, I think Dick, Dick's calculations are based on wall-to-wall uh, -wall retail uh, for every single building, but that's just not what the situation is right now. Right now, there is there is a single retail facility uh, permitted for 5,000 square feet. Going by the bylaws, that's going to require 33 parking spots, and we are adding to that another retail facility of 3,100 square feet. That's going to add 20.6 more parking spaces. So as Chris said, there's simply not enough parking for businesses to pack this, all three of these buildings uh, with no storage space. That's just not gonna be able to happen, but there's certainly enough parking for the two retail spaces that are, well, the one that's permitted and then now the second that's being proposed. I, I would just respond that, that if I may, Mr. Chairman, that uh, it's not the number of the square foot of the marijuana operation that governs the parking needs. It's the size of the entire property as set forth on the, in 171.28.6. Hence, hence we have to, to uh, uh, use the 8,000 uh, square foot figure, and we have to consider if there's any uses downstairs in the lower levels. But but it's it's not the entire property because there's not. My understanding is that there are not other businesses at the property currently. There's there's just Torre Verde is permitted there, and now this is the second proposed business. And the bylaws say one space for each 150 square feet of gross floor area. Uh, for retail stores, offices, and personal care establishments. So certainly, hypothetically, uh, the remaining vacant space could be filled with those things, but it is currently not. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that we can account for hypothetical parking or hypo for hypothetical businesses, I'm sorry. But we can comply with the bylaw, which requires uh, that, that the entire property be considered in, in calculating the number of spaces required, which makes perfect sense. If, and if I guess I, I would respond no by pointing out that- they couldn't get a permit. No one would be able to get a permit at this site if the entire property, including vacant unoccupied space was counted towards parking. It would be impossible to ever get a permit here for anybody. Well, Toro Verde got one. Who is speaking now? That was Isaac Fleischer. Thank you. I, I can't see anything. No names. No. <laughs> okay. Maybe. And, okay. and Dick, to your point, Torre Verde did get one without having, and, and this argument was not raised when Torre Verde wanted to move in. They didn't say, uh, they didn't calculate parking based on 100% occupancy of all three buildings on the site. And there's no re and, and that's never been the way parking is calculated uh, on, a, on a condominium site. You account for, for occupied space, not vacant space. There are three, actually four properties on this site. There's the three condo units and the common space. Each, each of those three is a property in and of itself.
Mr. Chairman, could I interject? This is uh, William Beats from Toro Verde. Yes. Ms. Evans obviously clearly presented the uh, our parking concerns, but I would like to add um, from when we had the planning board meeting uh, a week or two ago, one of the biggest concerns that came up because of the parking and took a hit on our plans because we were actually in negotiation with the Chamber of Commerce, as well as a, a restaurant uh, going into our adjacent building. And those talks with the restaurant uh, had to pause because they were bailing on us because they weren't going to have enough parking or the planning board basically insinuated that a special permit would be needed and any future business may not receive that special permit if DMC was already in there and we were exceeding the park. So obviously this took a hit to our economic plan because we were looking at number one, creating traffic to come into that plaza and number two, to uh, receive rent money from the adjacent building. And, you know, I don't blame DMC for wanting to come in this location. It's a great location, but we were already approved. We we're already there. We're already a part of the association. And, you know, to restrict, restrict our plans in where we were going with this, because DMC, you know, wants to be there uh, and there's not enough parking at this moment, uh, I just find that, you know, uh, I just find, I hope the board can see that at what's at stake here. Um, with econ not only parking, but the economic value that Toro Verde would take, uh, or the hit that we would take if this is approved. So I just wanted to interject that um, and really hope that the board takes in consideration of Toro Verde's plans that we had when we were approved. Thank you. How far is, uh, how far away is Toro Verde from actually opening? We're 90% done with uh, construction inside, and we are hoping for uh, to be open sometime in fall. And I, I had pictures, uh, but unfortunately my video stopped working and uh, I'm unable to show those pictures. That's why my video is not on. And I apologize for that. It's okay. Is, is there additional space on the property for additional parking? Could you please show a map again of the buildings on the, on the parcel? Not much. Maybe you could squeeze some more parkings here. To answer your question, I I, I don't I don't believe so. Uh, I think that's been that's been looked at in the past, and um, I think the south building, uh, the the parking on the south side of the property has been expanded, and uh, I think we're out to the boundaries and uh, we're, we're pretty well maxed out as an association. To, uh, property line for Route Five. Yeah, that's uh, that that's state owned. All right. That grass area. Okay. It, it's uh, it's 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 also part of the drainage system uh, for the state highway. And on the on the north, where that number six is, is that the boundary as well? That is the boundary, and actually, that's the uh, that's the Waitley Town line. Okay. I'm I'm not speaking for Toro Verde, but uh, from from my point of view, as as the uh, as the property owner and the landlord to Toro Verde, um, I think if everyone took a step back and uh, we might be able to have a conversation with uh, DMC and um, you know discuss this situation, um, that might not be a bad idea. But uh, you know, on on the outset here, this uh, this is um, it, for me as the property owner a pretty scary situation. You're the property owner of Unit A? I am. And Unit C? I am. And is that what, what is, I'm sorry, Roger. Is that what gives you the 51%, the combination of those two? Not, 
excuse, excuse me, Chairman, it's not, it's not 51%, it's 50.25%. Okay, is that what gives you the 50.25? It's the combination of A and C? Y yes, it is. Okay. Tr traditionally in a condominium, the more, the more property you own, the more common area uh, you have to, you control to. I, I just want to I want to step back for a second, and while we have this uh, this map on the screen, we can we can take a look at it and see that there are uh, A and B uh, are two roughly similar sized buildings, and then there's C. Uh, so you've got one property owner that owns about fifty, little over fifty percent of the units that is asserting that the, the other, what I don't know, 49.8% of the buildings cannot bring in any retail or office space because there wouldn't be enough parking for it. So just to, just to be clear, they don't, want, they don't want DMC there because it's a competing business. But when we're talking about parking, it's the same requirements for any retail and office space. So the same, the same argument and these same concerns would apply to any retail or office business that wanted to go in to Unit B. I, I just don't see how that can be, uh, how that can be allowed. How roughly half of the unit owners can can prohibit, you know, the the most likely use of the other half of the, uh, the condo. Excuse me, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. Um. Sorry, I, I, I mean, that's what I'm hearing, unless it's that it's only because it's marijuana use, but for, by the bylaws, it, it's not, there's no distinction between general retail and office space. Yeah, and, and again, that's, you know, in our analysis, we tried to estimate what the actual difference is, because the reality is that office uses do use significantly less parking space, but the bylaw treats them as if they're the same. Again, that's that's an artifact of the way that zoning bylaws have been written. Um, so, you know, what, what we presented is, you know, what's in my opinion, a, a conservative estimate of if this special permit is granted um, whether the parking is sufficient. And again, it's important to note that, you know, the, the office spaces could move in by right. Um, additional uses that are not office do require a special permit, um, but none of those have been uh, applied for at this time. I'm not, I'm not quite sure that office space, I mean, they might be able to move in by right, but if, if parking is overwhelmed, that would become an issue for any additional buildings. That would certainly be something we would be looking at. Is, is parking been an, an issue before on this property when both buildings were fully occupied? Not that's come before us. No, but I'm John, it's owner, do you know any cases before? I believe that was the reason on the uh, south building uh, while, there were, while the uh, bounds of the parking got pushed out uh, uh, to the maximum uh, because uh, Bay State Medical Center was occupying the uh, south building and leasing it from uh, Yankee Candle. I have a question. Uh, if a retail business went into B, they wouldn't need a special permit, correct? Uh, retail is a special permit use. It is a special permit, okay. Mm -hmm. Offices would not need a special permit, Kristen. Okay. Offices. But offices would require the parking spaces. Right? What? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is William Beats again. I just want to make this one uh, additional note uh, to reemphasize. With our vacant space of almost 
probably at 3,800 square feet, you know, and looking at, you know, 100, 150 seat restaurant, if DMC was to go in there and they were approved, then obviously that restaurant wouldn't be approved because of parking. So what is, I ask, you know, right now we're at a, at a stance that do we, is it DMC approved or not approved based off of, you know, one of the concerns of parking, but yet if we come in there with a restaurant, say two months from now and DMC is there, then we're going to get knocked down because of parking. And I just want to put that point out. Thank Where you. would your restaurant go exactly? There's a dividing wall. Uh, we, we, there was 8,000 square foot and we basically split it in half. Um, it's about 4,200 on the dispensary side and 3,800 for the other side. And it has, it has separate entrances. So it's basically, you could kind of, if you divided the, the building right in half, the left side would be the uh, possible restaurant side and the dispensary is on the right side of the building when you're facing it. Um, and I, I guess we would point out that right now there's a pending special permit for DMCTC's marijuana retail. There is no special permit application in that I'm aware of for a restaurant. Based off the planning board's comment, uh, comments, uh, negotiations had halted. Now, I, I totally understand that. I'm, I'm just pointing out that that one application is, is before the board and, and the other one is, is a theoretical future application. But it's something to be thought about. That's fair. So if building B were made smaller, would there be enough land to have adequate parking? Well, if you just uh, took the first floor, so there's about 16,000 square feet and divide that by 150, that's 200. Right, uh, six, no, 16 divided by 150 is what? Uh, Are you 110. Um, and so again, just to point out that this site was built with 87 spaces with the, well, it sounds like it was actually expanded. It was originally built with fewer than 87 spaces. Uh, with the knowledge that this was commercial buildings for commercial uses, um, despite the fact that the current bylaw requires more parking than that for uh, essentially um, all commercial uses when you count office, personal care, and um, uh, the, other, the others that fell under that portion of the bylaw. I, I want to reiterate that there is currently enough parking for, the, for Toro Verde and for DMC to operate there. More than enough. By both the, the projections that Chris has put together and also by the requirements of the zoning ordinance. Arla, I wanna make a little statement here. So um, <clears throat> when I was thinking about the uh, application before uh, this meeting started, obviously I was aware that there are there's an existing approved uh, location there at Toro Verde. I was on the board when we approved it. So our role as zoning board members is not to um, necessarily um, negotiate or um, jockey between competing business owners, uh, how they should conduct their business. Obviously our job is to enforce the bylaw and protect the community. But that said, um, <clears throat> I was also thinking about the traffic um, because my law office is in Northampton and like many people, I was aware of the crowds that were attracted to Netta when Netta first opened. However, there's another uh, marijuana dispensary in Northampton called Resonate <clears throat> that's diagonally across from my office and Despite the pandemic, um, I still go into the office, although not as much as before. And every time I go in, 
I look at that uh, parking lot for Resonate, and it's um, it's ninety percent empty. So uh, that was it's kind of jarring because there's a sign on the door that says open. So I went over there. This is just an anecdotal story, but it, it, it may be useful. I went over there uh, about a month ago because there's a a falafel truck that sells falafel right next to the parking lot. And I was talking to the guy. I said, does this place get any business? He says, it gets a ton of business. Uh, the cars come and they come and they go within five or 10 minutes. I said, oh, really? So I, I sat there and I ate my sandwich um, sitting on one of the railings of the parking lot. And within about 10 minutes, uh, there was a car from Minnesota that pulled up, a car from New York and a car from Connecticut. And um, it's not a very big lot, but that was all the traffic that was there. It was the middle of the afternoon and they were gone by the time I finished my sandwich. So Annetta continues to be really busy. And there's, there's police there, you know, monitoring and helping cars in and out. So I don't know that it's a given that there's going to be, um, that it's going to be a Netta type situation when Either of these shops open if they are both permitted. Obviously, Toro Verde is permitted. Uh, or it's going to be more like Resonate. Uh, um, so I don't know that, you know, 87 sounds like a lot of spots to me. Uh, I don't know that it's undersized for both of those locations. I, I, don't, I don't accept that as a given. Um, the place was built. Obviously, got a building permit with the number of spots that it had. Uh, I, I do want to look at the marijuana bylaw carefully, as Attorney Evans suggests, uh, because there are specific parking requirements in there that, that we as a board haven't had to focus on too carefully before. So what I was going to suggest is that we have both sides represented by counsel here, which is great. If each side wants to submit, I'll make it long, but two page memorandum of uh, of your thoughts on this issue. I think it might be uh, helpful for the board. You don't have to have a legal citation of other cases. There probably are no other cases. Uh, but, but just your thoughts, your math, the, um, the, you know, the common sense uh, conclusions that you're asking us to draw. I, th I think that would be helpful. And, you know, we can't speculate on whether some restaurant might come in there or Someone might apply for a special permit for a restaurant in the future. You know, we, we decide based on the facts as we know them. And um, so, you know, that, I'm just one person. But those are my those are my thoughts. I would welcome that very much, Roger. I think that would help clarify things for me. I think we very much need that. Okay. So then... But I think the other thing may be useful is, Roger, you alluded to this with your story here about Northampton is uh, these people are going to come and go during a day. And so you're not going to have the 100 or 87 cars in a lot at one time, probably. And I think uh, Chris mentioned a peak hour traffic on there. I think that was peak hour in relation to traffic on, on routes five and 116, but what's the peak hour demand gonna be maybe here for this building or this parcel may, may be helpful to see if it has enough capacity or not. It's, it's just hard because this, this is a spot where it does intersect with the interstate. Um, it's, but, you know, as Roger points out, we can't really speculate per se. And I do think things calm down after a while. I mean, the more and more marijuana dispensaries there are, the more and more, you know, people can shop around. Um, yeah. And, and I guess I would add that, you know, we did submit earlier this week uh, the parking analysis that we prepared that tried to really look at this in a few different ways that all turned out to be relatively consistent that the actual projection of both retailers plus the office space was between 50 and 60. Um, I then bumped that up as engineers do, assuming that the worst day is gonna happen um, and, and started to get into the 70s out of this 87 um, space parking lot. 
And uh, Roger's absolutely right that a lot of that does uh, uh, come down to the turnover. The, the average turnover is something like 10 to 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes um, for, for uh, visitors to the retail. Um. Chris, could you share a copy of that uh, parking uh, analysis, please? I'm happy to, yes. Are you asking to share it now or to share with you subsequently? Later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So before we um, adjourn, is it, we spent a lot of time on parking. Are there other issues that the board has questions about? David, do you want to speak uh, or do you want to hold off to wait for the board to receive our memos? Uh, yeah, I, I'll sort of defer it if, the, if I have a, a, just a couple comments to make about uh, some general issues in addition to traffic and parking, but happy to, to hold off if the board prefer to continue to a later meeting. Yeah, what I'm thinking of is we'll continue to September 2nd, which is our next meeting, and we'll give council or anyone from each side an opportunity to speak again at that next meeting. Understood. Okay. Roger, do we need anything from the condo association? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we have the representations of Mr. Bonavita, what his shares are and how they, how they are composed of unit A and unit C. I, I have a good working knowledge of condo law, so I think I can help us if we need to del deliberate on those issues. Uh, but the, the long and short of it is, like I say, it's, like, it's a democracy. So they would have an annual meeting, representative of unit A, representative of unit B, representative of unit C. Their voting rights would be established in the bylaws. If Mr. Bonavita's got the majority uh, interest, which it sounds like he does, he can uh, outvote a uh, unit, what does it be? And um, uh, well, in, in some cases, there are super majority requirements. In other words, in some cases in condo, you need more than just 50%. You might need two thirds or even three quarters of the unit owners to make substantial changes. But you know, the bylaws are gonna control what happens there. So I don't think we need anything from the condo association. I, I, I just wanna clarify on the, on, the, on the condo. I'd, I'd, be, I'd, be happy to, uh, I'd be happy to meet in advance um, with, with both groups, the, the, existing, the existing owner and a proposed owner and, uh, and, and, and uh, before the next meeting. The, the ownership of the of the common space is is not, is not something that can be altered by a vote generally. So, um, to the extent that a majority owner uh, could could control voting on on a lot of issues, I just want to clarify that wouldn't be a majority owner could not say uh, take exclusive control of common areas like parking. Yeah, I think I caught myself at the end there where I was getting ahead of myself on that. Well, you're welcome to come, Mr. Bonavita, to the next meeting for sure. If you want to uh, broker some um, uh, truce between everybody, that's great on, the, on, your, on your own, uh, go for it. But um, Mary, let's talk about September 2nd. <clears throat> Do we have 640 already uh, booked with the Whaley pump station? Uh, yes. <clears throat> All right. So why don't we start this next, uh, the continued meeting at 7 p.m. Okay. Okay, unless there's anything else, I think we're adjourned. Okay. Wait a minute. You wanted to, what did you want me to do? But we have minutes to approve. Did anybody get a chance to read them? Maybe not. And if we, if we're not going to do that, we still, uh, I want to revisit the thing you mentioned about uh, amending the minutes for sovereign builders so that we. Well, let's, let's let this meeting end. So. Oh, okay. So we're adjourned as to this meeting. You Thank see you in a second. Yes, Amber. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Welcome. All right, Mary, go for it. 
Uh, well, uh, I'm not, what, I don't have the minutes with the less, the Southern Builders things. Was that for, I can pull them up. What did, were you saying I should correct them now and you could pass them, pass no. that now? The existing minutes are the existing minutes. They stay the same. Oh, correct. Okay. So the, the, the new minutes are the. When I write the minutes for tonight's meeting, yes. I'll put in that we accepted uh, the entire plan from back in May, uh, including page nine of the narrative that has the correct figure for the square footage for the whole place. That's right. So, but what I was suggesting is that you could do a part A and a part B for tonight's minutes. And that part A would consist solely of the 640, the 640 meeting. Because I think Todd was just anxious. He wants to show the minutes to somebody. I don't know who, the lender or builder or somebody. To... I'll just write a quick part A. That's right. And then, uh, well, you can't, you can't approve it until uh, next month. Well, approve it September. I could send it, send it to him as a draft or something? Or, mm. or is that not a good idea? I have never done that before. <laughs> no. September 2nd will come quick enough, unfortunately. Okay. So, uh, We'll approve that September 2nd. If you have all the other minutes ready then too, that's fine, but at least you'll have that portion ready. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, we'll leave June 24th minutes till the next meeting and I should have July 1st written by then too. They're partly done. Well, unless, some, unless the majority of read June 24th. I didn't, has anybody read June 24th? I'm afraid I have not yet read it. Okay, we'll, you got plenty of time then. All right. <laughs> they were late. They, they should have come earlier. Uh, okay. Good luck, Bob. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, Mazel Tov. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you.